Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this Dive In Festival event. I'm Jessie Murphy Allen. I'll be chairing today's session and I'll take this opportunity to welcome our panelists and ask them to join us. So we've got a great panel here with us today to kick off this Dive In Festival event. Um, and I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we all meet and are coming from you today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are here today. Um, I'm coming to you from Adelaide. So I'm on Ghana country, but um, we're also coming to you from Yagara country and Tharawa country. So um, acknowledging the different locations that we've coming from today for this webinar. Uh, joining me today is uh, Dr. Dinesh Palipana, who is an advocate for people with disabilities. Uh, we have Dean Clifford Jones, who is the uh, Director of Pride in Law, and we have Lisa Anisi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Diversity Council. Um, the event today is hosted by um, AILA and Diversity at AILA. I'm on the Committee for Diversity at AILA, and we were really excited to partner with Pride in Law to bring this presentation to you today. Dive In has been a, um, a global movement which has um, been across the insurance sector. It started in 2015 and has grown since that time. Um, the mm -hmm. emphasis on diversity and inclusion has been built into Dive In for, since day one. Um, and they're very interesting and important concepts, but they're often ones that people sign up to and are very eager to get behind but don't really engage with on um, a detailed level. So I'd like to kick today off by asking each of the panellists in turn to talk about um, how do you define diversity and inclusion and why do you think it's important? Uh, perhaps Lisa we'll start with you. Thanks Jessie. Um, hi everyone, I'm coming to you today from Camaragal land on Sydney's northern beaches and um, I acknowledge any Indigenous, um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be um, joining us today and pay my respects. Um, what is diversity and inclusion? It's a really good question because I think that often you can ask people, 10 different people and get 10 different responses. But the DCA, which is the organisation that I run, we're a not-for-profit, member-funded um, organisation that works with employers across the whole labour market. We represent over 20% of the labour market, but we're armed with, um, well, the engine room of the work we do really is research. So we um, are quite immersed in research and use that to inform our advice on diversity and inclusion. So part of that, of course, has been creating a definition of what is diversity and what is inclusion in the Australian workplace context. Um, because even though there are things about diversity which are consistent across jurisdictions, it's really important to have a local focus as well. I can just hear some background noise, so could I just ask people to mute if they're, um, if they're not? Thank you. So at DCA, we um, have a definition of diversity which is around looking at people in terms of their social and their professional identity. So if I was presenting to you with a PowerPoint, I'd put up a diagram that showed you little bubbles, which are all aspects of somebody's identity, their gender, um, their sex and their gender, their culture and their race, their age, um, their status as a carer, their status potentially as a person with a disability, um, they may be LGBTIQ+. We also include aspects like, um, or whether they're First Nations, and we also include aspects like social class, which is rarely discussed in Australia, but is relevant 
because it really predicts the experience of um, inclusion and exclusion in a workplace and, of course, access to privilege. And so that social class lens is really important. Lots of those elements of diversity are attributes that are protected by the law, um, but not all of them. And so we know that it is important to recognise that people belong to these different groups and the aspects of their social identity usually mean that people have things in common with other people who share that identity. Um, it's not to say groups are homogenous. Indeed, that's a big mistake people make is by assuming, for example, if you work in the gender space, that all women are the same. And um, a generation of affirmative action programs in Australia, which don't recognise the diversity amongst women as one example, have meant that the solutions for gender equality have benefited a, a narrow group of women. So it's important to look at um, social groups in terms of their complexity. At DCA, we also layer onto that a prof the aspect of professional identity, because within a workplace, that also matters. Where did you study? What university did you go to? What is your profession? Where are you ranked in the organisation? Lots of aspects of inclusion or exclusion are intrinsically linked to institutional power. So those things matter. Um, and so we would overlay aspects of social identity and professional identity to create um, a persona for an individual, which means that these are the things that influence the way they view the world because of their lived experience. But it also influences the way you view others because you view others through your lens, not their lens. And that's an important thing to understand around the dynamic. So diversity is really about all the ways in which human beings are different. Um, inclusion at DCA, we define and measure um, as a process of making that mix of people work effectively within an organisation. And I won't labour this point too much, but other than to say it's defined by four pillars, um, and those pillars include a respectful environment. So if you want to create an inclusive environment, you have to focus on workplace respect, you have to focus on human connection, um, and you have to focus on opportunity or advancement or development. So that's a third pillar. And the fourth is you have to do job design in a sophisticated way that means people have meaningful work. Often people mistakenly or naively talk about inclusion interchangeably with the word belonging. And belonging is important. It fits in the connection component. But you can feel like you belong somewhere. You can be part of a a pride group or a, a reconciliation group, have a wrap. But if you don't have opportunities for progress, if your job isn't designed in a way that's meaningful, so you have a disability, sure, you might have great relationships, but the way your job is designed means you fall off the career ladder, um, then your experience is not inclusion. So the process of inclusion has to actually be approached with a bit of rigour and a bit of um, um, science behind it in order to be effective that's beautiful and i'll leave it there beautiful we might jump to dinesh because um there lisa you were talking about um that distinction between belonging belonging and inclusion and dinesh your experiences have been um come really into contact with those issues oh i think we might have Oh, there he is. Had a little bit of lag, oh, sorry. sorry. No, it's still here. <laughs> yeah, I think my connection is very laggy, so I apologise if I skip. Um, and uh, sorry, Jesse, can I just ask you to repeat that last bit again? Um, so as part of the, the wider question of the definition and in, in of diversity and inclusion and why it's important, Lisa spoke to um, the fact that inclusion actually involves the ability to progress and to develop through your career um that's something that's mm. that you've come up directly against and have have faced um can i ask you to talk to your definitions but also your experiences there yeah you know it's uh, uh today i'm actually at a medical conference and i'm with medical leaders across the country and we had a we had a discussion about inclusion and diversity and disability and my journey to get to this point has been you know it's 
it's been incredibly challenging at some points because I work in a profession that has historically been very, very conservative. They're very set in the way they've done things and they don't want to adapt. So when I came back to medical school as uh, after sustaining a spinal cord injury and after becoming paralyzed from my chest down and my fingers, I had to have some very confronting conversations. And these included conversations from everything from we don't think the patients will take you seriously to how you're going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and over time, these conversations become less and less. I think I've become more and more adaptable and open minded. Uh, but still, to this day, I run across some uh, some people who ask questions. So uh, over the last Oh, say six months. This is now my sixth year as a doctor. I work at the busiest in Australia. I supervise junior doctors. I run at night. All these things. But um, even over the last year, I've had questions from, say, the uh, conservative surgeon: Is his medical degree as valid as anyone else's? Or uh, are you able to train as a specialist in this area because you can't do X, Y, and Z? So there, there are still um, issues with progression that I come across every now and again, although they have become less and less and less. So I think um, in medicine, at least, inclu inclusion is we're, we're getting better at it, but it's still challenging. But it's required uh, champions and allies to make things work. And I've been lucky enough to have enough allies and enough people that believe that it's an important thing to do, that believe that it's the right thing to do, and have fought for me to progress through my career. And there have even been people like when I was off the table, take a part of our salary to fund his. So I think allies have been important in this journey of inclusion. But yeah, belonging, I think, um, it, it is, thanks Lisa for what you said, I think it's a really important point, but what makes me feel empowered to go and have these conversations and what makes me feel, uh, I, was, I was just on a panel with another doctor with a disability and she was just saying that when she's at work, it feels, and for me it's the same as well because, in the place that I work in, I feel like I belong. And when I feel like I belong, I feel empowered. And I feel less disabled in my workplace, you know, going out for that reason. So um, it's, I think medicine uh, is probably one of those professions that's shown me the extremes um, of all things. Um, and it's probably one that we, we are really trying to work on um, to, to make better. And hopefully that has a flow on effect to everywhere else as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Dinesh. Um, Dean, if I can put that, that same question to you about how, how you come at diversity and inclusion and why it's important. Yeah, no worries, Jesse. Well, I also join in and acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which we meet and I um, share what Lisa has said from the Diversity Council of Australia and diversity and inclusion from Pride in Law's perspective and Pride in Law is a national LGBTIQ plus law association and so diversity and inclusion for us are two interconnected concepts but they are far from interchangeable as Lisa has mentioned. Diversity is about representation, it is about the makeup of an entity where inclusion is about well how do those contributions, that presence, that perspectives of different groups of people uh, are valued and uh, integ integrated into our environment. And that's what diversity and inclusion is all about, but they are far from interchangeable. I suppose from my perspective, uh, a diverse workplace, it, it's an important asset. It acknowledges the individual, the individual strengths of an employee, the potential that they bring the valuing the differences of others and what, and what ultimately brings us all together. And I suppose this, they're the secret ingredients that bring us to a thriving workplace, to a fair work culture, because inclusion is about making sure those people who are marginalised in our part of society, as Lisa has mentioned, 
those people with a disability, those minority groups, they not only have to be told that they are included, but we have to feel like we're included. To me, inclusion feels like, you know, not just you are accepted or appreciated, it goes beyond that. It makes me feel like I am valued, that I am respected, um, that I am involved in the decision making of the organisation. Beautiful. Thanks, Dean. Um, we might stick with you for a minute and um, if you could share some of your um, experiences through your advocacy and your involvement with Pride in Law about the good and the bad that happens in this space and what, what perhaps the good and the bad look like and how they those experiences are felt. Yeah, so I started working in the uh, legal industry in 2004 um, and uh, I've seen great changes in that industry um, since then. And uh, working for Pride in Law, I founded Pride in Law in 2017 because I really noticed that there was a lot of work that still needed to be done. And um, so after living in regional Queensland, I came back to live in Brisbane here in Queensland and I noticed that there was quite a few of my colleagues still working in the legal industry that weren't out in their workplace. Now, a lot of people don't realise this, but um, if I can just put off a few statistics to you to try to help you understand the framework. But I think it was a 2001 survey by seek.com. They found almost 45 percent of Australians say that they've noticed an improvement in inclusion and diversity in their workplace during their own tenure. But rainbow employees are still twice as likely to be victim, victims of workplace discrimination as they're compared to their non LGBTIQ plus colleagues. Of employees who had witnessed discrimination, 57% of the rainbow employees said that they feel like they hadn't been able to have a sense of resolution. Rainbow employees are still two and a half times more likely to call in sick or skip work because they feel unsafe because of discrimination. You know, this is replicated in separate research across Australia. Um, my understanding is that um, for workers aged between 18 to 45, a lot of those people, 24% of them, go back into the closet because they feel like they are not being you know, accepted in the workplace itself. Existing research shows, um, and I think there was a 2007 Thomas Reuters survey of 653 lawyers from memory, reported that an overwhelming majority of them didn't feel, and them being rainbow employees, didn't feel that the profession as a whole still um, needed to improve their concept of diversity and inclusion to make people feel like they are part of that community, that legal industry. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Dean. Um, Dinesh, you, you touched on this um, earlier about some of your experiences. Um, have there been good ones as well as bad or is it has it been a mix or um, what's the overwhelming um, takeaway that you've had from dealing with these issues? Yeah, I think um, there are, if, if, if we break it down, I think there is a lot of all appetite from high levels um, like boards and governments to to try and be inclusive and to try and try and break these barriers down for people and try to so there's there's a lot of leadership that's really interested in these conversations but i think where it breaks down is there's somewhere in that middle layer to the bottom layer where it where it sort of starts to break down and it starts to become challenging and when I've been navigating um, issues for people with disability, uh, myself or others, I think there's all, there's always that appetite and there's always like, yep, let's get it done from the top. But then when it starts to trickle down into wh where it actually needs to happen on the ground, it's like, oh, actually, this is too hard and this is too hard and this won't happen and this won't happen and it's too complicated. And, you know, I've even come across things like where there's been colleagues other doctors who um, have acquired injuries and use wheelchairs where their hospital human resources have gone, oh, it's a bit of a risk. What if you fall out of the wheelchair or what if you, which I think is pretty ironic because most patients, uh, many patients use wheelchairs and there are beds that roll around. So there are things like that. So I think there's a bit of a disconnect between that level and um, 
the high levels and the and the levels that actually action some of this stuff. And we need to, um, I think we need to really start start working um, on the ground to do that. But for me, my own experience is the biggest, again, the biggest asset to myself has been allies and people who have navigated some of those conversations and senior doctors who have navigated some of these issues and people who have um, helped me help worked around some of those solutions and actually provided solutions i think it's also a um it's also been a state of affairs where which which is kind of unfortunate in a way but i find that I go with solutions to some of these some of these people particularly human resources and bureaucrats so um yeah, but it, it's it's just, I think we can have all the strategies and all the policies and all the, even the laws that we want, but if we're not getting it at that level where it's practically happening, I think it becomes a very, very difficult thing. Yeah. And so what are the characteristics of um, an organisation that it accomplishes and encourages diversity and inclusion. Lisa, perhaps I'll go to you on, on that one first. Yeah, it's a good question because accomplishing diversity is a, again, I mean, I started off by talking about what diversity was. It's a big, it's a big picture thing. I mean, people can, people's identities are vast and varied and the other thing that's already been touched on here is this is complex and um, the complex part of it is the behavioural change piece that has to happen internally. And because most people, if something doesn't hasn't been part of their lived experience, they, unless they're active learners that are always seeking to understand other perspectives, they haven't built the... Um, the framework for which to see things that for other people are really is really obvious for them to see. So you're actually dealing with quite a big barrier. So in terms of achieving how to achieve a diverse and inclusive workplace, I think the, the big thing organisations have to figure out is what does that look like for them and what are their priority areas? Now, there are some things that they can't get around. You, you're obligated by law to make workplaces accessible. Um, and then there are other things which now there is a lot of political appetite for. So we're going to see over the next 18 months a big national conversation around First Nations um, reconciliation. But you'll have other stakeholder groups who will be demanding um, inclusion for them, for their identity. And um, Dean discussed a little bit about what it's like for people in the rainbow community and indeed our research um, which we did with Pride and Diversity called Out at Work um, concurs with those with those findings, which actually, which actually surprises people a lot. They think that actually we are a rainbow inclusive culture, but we unpacked it and found that only thirty percent of people are fully out at work, and for other people, it's a it's a um, a melting pot of to what extent do I come out? Because they have to come out every day. Sometimes they have to come out many times a day and it's just exhausting. So um, unpack, pulling up all these layers mean that organisations, I would always advise them to really try and make a decision about what kind of a workplace do they want to be? And so what are their focus areas going to be? Because you don't want to half do it um, because then you'll disappoint everybody. But if you make a commitment that we're going to be an accessible workplace, we're going to commit to the inclusion of First Nations peoples, we're going to be, we're going to focus on gender equality, we're going to focus on LGBTQ plus inclusion, you need to properly plan that and you need to not relegate that just to the interested parties who are probably tagging it onto their already full workload and getting no extra pay. And for many of them, it's there's a cultural load for them that they are they are burdening themselves with. And as long as you leave, I mean, I think Dinesh touched on this, you know, the role of allies, but it's got to be bigger than that. The allies, yes, they're important. It's actually got to be the role of all leaders in an organisation because as long as it's um, just one group 
that's taking responsibility, then no one will take responsibility for the ownership of the kind of change that has to happen for this to become mainstream. I've been working in this space for a really long time. And if I could compare it to what's happened in the gender equality space, and by gender, I'm going to use the binary um, structure of just focusing on women versus men, because we've only started talking about non-binary gender identities recently. So there's a longer history when we're talking about women and their acceptance into the workplace and their progression through leadership. It's been a couple of decades and we're still not there. We still have a lack of representation of women in most areas in leadership. The best performing area are ASX boards, but that's not even at 30%. Um, and then the women that are there all look the same. And then what we understand is that there are still high levels of workplace sexual harassment. There's still a gender pay gap. We still don't have mainstream flexible careers. And women are not a minority. And they are very organised and loud and agitate. So if we can't get it right for this group that's not a minority, you can imagine that if you leave the process of inclusion to the people whose lives it directly affects, how that's very convenient for people who want to retain the status quo because we all know that actually very little is going to get done. It needs to move into the mainstream. It needs to be people with lived experience working side by side with people who have power and influence in an organisation who are committed to changing the culture and are committed to resourcing this properly and are committed to a transformational piece of work, not a pet project, not a working group, but a transformational piece of organisational culture change. Because if you do that, getting back to the DCA definition of inclusion that we measure every two years across the labour market, across all industries, what we see every time we measure it is that inclusive workplaces the ones that are respectful and connected and you know and enable diverse people to contribute their talents and you know build their skills are more innovative not a little bit a lot they're more productive people give more discretionary effort um, people make fewer mistakes people manage risk better there are few, fewer workplace health and safety accidents. There are fewer incidents of workplace harassment and bullying. Your risk profile fall, falls and your productivity and innovation profile increases. So even if leaders are not engaged because this is the right thing to do, because, you know, uh, why wouldn't you? Um, there's an as a as a moral and there's a business imperative. The other thing to say about that, we're operating now in a market where there's a skills shortage and a talent shortage in many industries and there's a hidden workforce that never get to contribute their talents either because they're overlooked at recruitment or because as Dean stated they become demoralised or as Dinesh stated the the exhaustion of always having to fight for yourself can can make you disaffected um, and so you therefore don't contribute your your best so businesses have everything to gain and nothing to lose but they have to invest in it. Um, and it's a bit of a superpower when they do. Thanks, Lisa. Dean, can I ask you to, to talk to that um, that same theme of what, um, from Pride in Law's perspective, what a culture that encourages and um, works towards actually having diversity and inclusion as their tenants, what that looks like and um, what's important? Yeah, um, well, can I first say, Jesse, um, there was, there's been media even today, which is something that we need to celebrate, that the High Court of Australia will, from October this year, have the majority of females represented in the highest courts of Australia, that being in the High Court of Australia. That's the first time in 121 years that that will happen. So it's really something I think we've got to celebrate those moments. But in terms of turning to your question in particular, what are the characteristics? Well, I think from Pride in Law's perspective, we've given this a lot of thought and there are seven characteristics. Now, the first is around holding leaders accountable for advancing diversity. Lisa has already mentioned that. We have to hold them accountable. Number two, we've got to partner with organisations and end institutions and to help them widen their pipeline 
partner with DCA, partner with Pride in Law, partner with other organisations to make them more accountable and to help them along the way. Uh, number three, I think we've got to acknowledge and navigate our own biases. And when sourcing candidates, we got to acknowledge our own privileges as well. Um, from uh, Pride in Law's perspective, we're constantly analysing and acknowledging those biases and privileges. Um, number four, we've got to conduct our own inclusive audits. So when you're in your organisation, it's not enough just to be diverse. You have to then audit that and regularly update that as DCA and Lisa has just acknowledged every two years they go through that reassessment that is vital to making sure that you have a diverse and inclusive workplace. And number five is around and creating inclusive workplace policies. It's not enough to say that you're diverse and inclusive. You have to have the policies laid down to actually reflect the nature and that culture of the workplace. Uh, number six, offer your employees outlets to regularly share their stories. Stories are such an important aspect of how we progress diversity and inclusion. And number seven, offer education like we're doing here today. Offer your employees an opportunity to fight those biases and to fight that racism because that does exist even though it's not always acknowledged. Fantastic. Thanks, Dean. Um, and that really covers off on, on this idea that there are real practical steps that um, organisations can take um, and that, that is a, it's a, a task which isn't something that you can tack on at the bottom of an agenda, it's something that requires commitment and action. Um, in terms of on a more personal level, are there practical steps that individuals within an organisation can take? to assist with that? Perhaps Dean will go to you again. Yeah, look, from my personal perspective, um, what we do and what I do, well, look, I mean, today I'm wearing a rainbow collared shirt. I'm about being visible because in my view, you know, wearing, uh, you know, the, a pride in law badge or wear, putting your email signature and having your pronouns. Um, I display a sticker in my workplace as well on my front door of my office. These are some practical steps because it's hard to be what you can't see. Change won't just happen. It has to be created. It has to be nurtured. It has to be employed by all of us. I think we have to demonstrate passion and courage. Um, that's a practical step that we can all do. We can all be better allies um, and we have to call out homophobic and transphobic um, remarks. Um, calling it out will help educate others. I think from another practical point of view, I think we have to practice sponsorship. We have to encourage, um, from my perspective, rainbow initiatives. And I'm sure from what other perspectives as well, we have to encourage those to participate in the change. And I think we have to um, finally inspire others, inspire what we want to see, because in my, I, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, pride is not about who you are. It is about what you represent. Equality, respect, acceptance of others, and it's about acceptance of yourself. Fabulous. Thanks, Dean. Dinesh, can I ask you to to speak to the, the practical individual actions that um, you've in, come across in your in your advocacy and in your experiences and what you think they, they can do to add to, to the process? Yeah, um, thank you. I think uh, for someone, again, I was just on a panel earlier and someone with a disability was saying that how exhausting it is for them to fight and fight and fight for the basic things that they have to access to, like what and accessibility and all those things, but I think, I think um, one of the things that prevents us from being activists in the workplace um, and to change things is the power structure and our fear that speaking out or being or, or doing something will actually affect our career progression or whether it will result in some retribution or whatever else and particularly in medicine and I think law as well this is true to a certain extent and so the 
those really, um, really vertical, strict power structures have always been an issue. Is to just overcome that fear. Actually, you know, the people that are our leaders are answerable to us, whether they be politicians or whether they be CEOs or whether they be whatever. And we're in a time right now, we're in 2022, where we've had some of these movements that have forced these people to change. Like um, we've, we've had things like Black Lives Matter and um, they, they've come and they've the voice of the people is actually loud. So I think we have to be a bit fearless. Is something where someone's being affected, we have to call it out and we have to speak up. So I think the simplest thing is to speak up if you see something that's not right. And if you speak up when someone's being discriminated against and speak up if there's homophobic language or something like that happening and call it out and say that it's not right. So I think it, it takes it takes a culture and a community to, to do those things. And um, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of people to be able to speak up and to to support each other. You know, what I'm going to my workplace is that every, everyone is like that and everyone will call out things that are wrong, but everyone will also support each other. And they make me feel like just a normal member of the team, which I love. Um, but then there's the leadership as well. I think um, if you're an individual and you're a leader, I think you have to be a bit courageous um, and uh, about supporting people. And, and um, I think, I really love what Lisa said, that it's actually a business imperative to do this. And I think that has to be one of the things. So there's the cat. I think you have to not be afraid to wield the stick. And if if there are things that are wrong, people are, people are doing this kind of thing. I think um, we also have to make sure that the stick comes out and people are held responsible accordingly. Beautiful. Thanks, Dinesh. There's, there's some real themes that are starting to emerge in what we've we've talked about, particularly in relation to leadership and accountability. Lisa, perhaps if I can ask you to speak to um, the research that the Diversity Council's done and what are those key things that allow this to be done successfully um, and what you've spoken previously about it needs to be a concerted effort and it can't just be tacked on. Um, what are the, the steps or the characteristics that mean it, it is successful? It's a really good question because our research um, shows that 80 to 85% of all diversity and inclusion initiatives that are done by organisations don't achieve their objectives. And the reasons um, when you unpack that and you have a look at why, well, it's because it's not being treated um, in the way you would treat other change work. Because this, this is a big, it's a big piece of work that requires, you're trying to change humans. Um, it's, not a, it's not as simple as instituting a new technical process. We're trying to change behaviour. Um, some of that can be controlled with policy and through industrial practices but the a lot of organizations have really thick best practice policy manuals that nobody ever reads um, so it really is about um, framing dni change in a way that will work and what we recommend at dca is that you use like a theory of change approach um, which you would use for any significant piece of transformational work where you identify and you create a really clear um, business need. And that's not hard to do. There's so much evidence to show that this is really great for business. The reason it's important to always come back to the business case is you're going to have to engage stakeholders who don't care about this and stakeholders who are motivated by self-interest. And so, and you know, it's not, I don't think it'd be a surprise that people who lead Australia's biggest institutions have got a, quite a lot of personal self-interest um, or they never would have gotten there. So 
to play into that, you really have to understand that the business case is really important. Other stakeholders are really important as well. Figure out what your stakeholders are and how you can bring pressure. A lot of the stuff in the gender space happened because of regulatory pressures from the ASX, um, from the AICD, from um, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And so, you know, in the absence of those regulatory pressures, because we don't really have them for other diversity groups, other than we've got, you know, Commonwealth Act, anti-discrimination law, Commonwealth anti-racism law and age discrimination law, et cetera, and state based. But that's sort of the last common denominator. What you're trying to do is create a culture shift. Um, and so to do that, you need to identify business need. You then need to design the change. And part of that has to be a commitment to building capability because people don't know how to do this. And the other thing is that people are scared to get it wrong. Well-meaning people say nothing because they're terrified of saying the wrong thing and fearing that they will be forever held to that mistake. So creating that kind of safety. Um, but it's also about resourcing the change properly, making sure that it is embedded into standard business practices. So if you have a leadership framework that you measure leaders on, add inclusion into that leadership framework. Um, it also means you have to have a good long look at the whole employee life cycle, all the processes. So this is a complex thing from recruitment through to talent identification through to um, even separation from the organisation. How do decisions get made? How do we minimise or control for the biases that mean we have affinity for people who are just like us. Um, and again, that's another very complex thing. You know, we know just looking at recruitment, we know more and more people are relying on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so how do you understand the impact of that on people who um, might traditionally be minimised through that I can go into that in more detail if you want. Um, but the final thing, you have to have a, a plan for implementation, depending on what the change is that you're trying to create. And then you have to evaluate and improve. In this space, for some reason, no one ever evaluates. What people do is, did it work? No, it didn't. Let's cancel that program and do something else. Whereas actually what you should be doing and what organisations tend to do with programs that they are committed to is they understand what went wrong, how can we improve the processes? So this is a big piece of culture change work that requires leadership engagement, proper resourcing, skillful HR, because they have an important role in improving capability, um, and accountability and evaluation. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I might take this opportunity to ask if there's um, any particular thoughts that the panel would like to, to leave us with before we go to questions. Um, there is a, a question and answer facility through Teams. So if anyone has a question that they'd like our panel to ask, uh, please pop it in there and um, I'll open it up to the panel. Um, while we're waiting for questions, Dean, um, any final thoughts? Yeah, look, I, I think if there's a message that I'd love to provide to the audience out there is that there's no one size fits all strategy that will be advancing your diversity and your inclusion and your equity programs. Ultimately, the best policies that are best for you will depend on a variety of factors, including your own goals, your own regions that you live in, where you operate, but of course, your own budgets. And putting a budget behind diversity, equity and inclusion is important. These are not just all volunteer um, spaces. You have to put your efforts behind diversity, inclusion, equity, acceptance, belonging, respect. Please, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we all got to be and bring our whole selves. We all got to be visible in this space. Um, because not one person can do it alone. Fantastic. Thanks, Dean. Dinesh, any final thoughts? Yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts, actually. Um, one is just start with one person at a time. You know, often your teams are 
small enough actually that one person will make a big impact and for that one person you're going to make a massive change in their lives and they're going to make a massive change in their team so just start with one one at a time that's all it takes and you'll create a snowball effect i think the second thing is it's interesting that we have these conversations about diversity and inclusion because I'd, I'd love to see the day where we don't have to have this chat and where all of us panelists become irrelevant because actually our society is diverse already one in five Australians have a disability yet it was only now that we got a chairperson with a disability in the NDIS um, we have so much cultural and linguistical diversity with the we have the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, and so we have so much diversity there already in our society. And it's almost overwhelming and it's significant. And for some of these communities, can you really call it a minority anymore? But actually the challenge is that we're just not being inclusive yet. So, um, I hope that we, we're getting to a point through the work and these voices that we're having where we just, I would just love to see the day where we don't have to have these conversations. And I would love to see the day where, you know, a doctor in a wheelchair in an ED is not anything out of the ordinary, it's just some random guy doing his job. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks Dinesh. Lisa, any final thoughts? Um. Look, I think, I mean, I would always say this can feel like a very daunting place to work in. For people who are immersed, it makes sense to us and it's obvious, but for others it can be a really daunting place. So I would suggest to people try, there is so much great work out there already, and try and be led by evidence. I often see people being led by um, feelings, really, and feelings are obviously important, but... Um, you've got to be led by the things that will actually work. And um, we're an NGO and we've got a lot of stuff available to support people um, on our website. The other thing I would say is that um, I think that this is always an emerging area of change and you really have to have a growth mindset around it. And that means that be open to the fact that you don't know everything, I don't know everything, and I'm always learning as well. And I wouldn't even, I mean, maybe I know quite a bit about DNI, but I'm forever learning because we're forever testing and doing research. So just because something is the way it is today, it doesn't mean it won't move along tomorrow because we know more or because we've given a voice to a group that previously didn't have a voice. I, I especially think of the next 80 months, we're gonna be hearing a lot about First Nations reconciliation. The big principle there is also to be led by people who have the lived experience. Don't assume for them. Um, don't overload, not just First Nations people, but any group. Um, and just be mindful of those best practice principles if you want to be a great change agent. But I can confidently say that people who do this well, um, you know, your organisation will really benefit from it and individuals. And it makes sense because if everyone in this room virtually can think of a time in their life when they were excluded, they could, they didn't get picked for the sport team at school or they weren't part of a friendship group or something about them which was irrelevant, um, they had to become hyper aware of that or they felt like their talents weren't seen and that could even be within their own family. How did that make you feel? It doesn't make you want to give your best. And think about the time when you're in the company of people who see you and who value you and what does that mean about what you want to do? The same, we're all human beings in the workplace and unless you're a sociopath, which most people are not, um, we're all, um, we respond to those things and it helps us give our best. I mean, Dinesh, the fact that you're able to continue to practice medicine, if he wasn't able to, what a loss that would have been in a profession that I think COVID has shown is probably one of the most important professions we can have. And I think, um, like you said about now that we've got Kurt Fernley chairing the NDIS, why did it take us so long? To have someone with lived experience leading an organisation like that, hopefully that will be transformative for the NDIS. So, um, but I'm hopeful for the future. 
And I just think we've got to just keep at it, have a positive attitude. And if you are a change maker, you've got to find your tribe and and find something that keeps you resilient because this is very tough work to do. I think that that's a really great um, takeaway there at the end for those those of us who are wanting to contribute more in in and certainly fits in with some of the things that Dean and Dinesh have, have spoken about, about finding a tribe and finding ways to continue to contribute in this space without um, and have the resilience to continue to do so because it is such imp important work. And um, that example of um, everyone knows what it's like to feel excluded at some point, um, being able to use those experiences to have a curiosity about other people's experience and contribute to change is a really powerful um, emotive image to leave everyone with. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of our, our panel, Dean, Dinesh and Lisa. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, it's been a really interesting and really valuable discussion and um, um, I've written down a little um, notepad and I didn't quite expect to, to have it so full, but my handwriting's gotten smaller and smaller as, as we've gone on because I've wanted to grab those, those nuggets of insight that you've provided. So thank you very, very much for that. And um, thank you very much for agreeing to be part of ALR and Pride in Law's um, Dive In Festival event. Ooh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank thanks. I'll Bye. sign off now and uh, say thanks again, everyone, for attending. And bye.